Hello and welcome to another edition of Convict Inc. I'm your host, Robert Rosso. If you have not subscribed to this channel, please do so. My hope is that um, you're not going to hear the little buzzing noise in the dashboard or whatever for too long because I'm on the interstate, hopefully. Uh, I have to do this video now because I realize there's not going to be any more time later. And I was thinking about going live and uh, might be other plans, says my wife. So I'm going to go ahead and try this. Hopefully the sound is going to be okay, at least enough where you guys can hear me. If you like this video, please push like, share it with your family, neighbors, friends, enemies, etc. In 2012, I was transferred from Butner FCI 2 to FCI Terre Haute or Terre Haute in Indiana. A few days after I arrived, I heard a guy making a lot of noise, uh, a black guy from Minnesota, who on the first day I saw punch a white guy in the back of the head and was then later told that this guy fought off. His name was Tito. Cut up, bald head. Um, he, he, he liked to fight and he can fight. The commotion was between him and his celly. He's basically told his celly not to come lock in during count that he was going to beat him up the celly looked a little you know a little 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 rocked probably because he knew that tito was a good fighter whatever and the celly was actually i would later find out uh, a guy that really didn't want a bunch of problems i'm not saying the guy that ducked wreck but um yeah he he just he worked unicorn he didn't get in any trouble anyway the guy's name was cadillac or Delroy Brown. Sometime later, I'm going to say about six months or more, they started doing mandatory cell rotations in the prisons. This started because there was an escape that happened at a MDC, I think it is Chicago or whatever it is, the, the holding center in Chicago. Some inmates escaped. They had been in the same cell for a long time. So the, the thinking is, is that if an inmate stays in a cell a long time, they can cut bars, you know, uh, make paper mache the walls or, or center blocks, whatever. So if they move them every six months, it would be a lot harder to, to knock bricks out of the cell or, or knock the bars out of the windows and stuff like that. Cell rotations really suck and I need to do a video on that too. Anyway. I was moved from my cell upstairs to, uh, what was it, cell 19. This is in C block. It was all the way in the end up at the front. And my neighbor was none other than Cadillac or Delroy Brown. Cadillac is Jamaican from Jamaica. He came to the United States, I believe on a work visa many, many years ago. Ultimately became a, a drug dealer primarily marijuana, and got a pretty big sentence for pot. I think it was like 14 years. And I believe it was all just pot. I could be wrong. Over the course of, let's say, I don't know, six months, me and Cadillac started talking a lot. And I'm going to tell you, he's a sharp guy. I really enjoyed talking to him because, again, and I've repeated this many times, he knew a lot about current events. He didn't talk about all the prison BS or the drugs and the hose and the, he, he had conversation that, uh, you know, can, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, your mind, um, not enlighten your mind. It, it, it many bottom line, I'm, I'm stuck. So I'm looking at in my rear view mirror. Uh, he had really good conversation. We can sit for hours and talk. And I believe he would agree to that 100%. Now, at this time in my life, this was, let's say, 2013, I knew a girl from Australia, who I did a video about, who just sent me Suboxone underneath the stamp. Just boom, and then uh, I had it sitting for like almost a month before I realized she made reference and I went back and looked at the letter and pulled the stamp. 
But what happened was, her name was Sharna, and I, I have talked before about when I met her, I had a friend, she told me cocaine was five or $600 a gram in Australia. And a friend of mine got out and just didn't know nothing, sent some, some cocaine to Australia in a letter. And uh, she cut it like a, on every gram, she cut it like two grams and sent me $500 a gram straight up, which I'd never even asked for. But the point is, is after 10 years in prison, I pretty much knew I was never gonna deal drugs again. But that incident in Australia, like opened up my mind a little bit, like, huh, maybe I can just sling some drugs in Australia uh, if I got out, or while I was in prison. I ended up talking to a couple guys that were going home and were gonna be involved in the drug trade. And yes, I had conversations like, hey, I, I can do this if you send this to Australia. Yes, I did, I absolutely did. This was a short amount of time, but I did. The guy's name, I'm gonna call him, uh, well, it was T.Y., I got him T.Y. And there was, a, the conversations weren't necessarily serious, but they were conversations indeed. One day, T.Y. comes to me and said, hey man, uh, Cadillac said that he thinks you're hot, like a snitch, in prison. And the reason he brought that up was because of the conversations that we had. And I'm like, what? Like me and Cadillac are cool, we're talking. So whatever, uh, apparently T.Y. told Cadillac what I said, of the conversations we were having. And I, for whatever reason, Cadillac said that he thought I was a snitch or hot or whatever. Now I need to back up because the first 10 years in prison, I'm, nobody would even think that about me or say that. After I got sober in 2007 for nearly four years, I began writing and some of the stories I wrote about were prison. And while I was at Butner FCI one, nobody ever made any uh, statements or there was never any whispers of me being a rat because of what I was writing. When I was at Butner FCI two, however, there were some people that were questioning me. And moreover, what happened, what was different at Butner FCI two was that I began frequently talking to staff. Now let me explain. I have said before that as the leader, shot caller of the Dirty White Boys at Lewisburg, they had a policy where every gang leader, no matter what group, gang, whatever, they made sit on a bench in front of the captain's office and made go to SIS, which is the Institutional Supervised Investigators, and they would make you sit for five minutes. And the reason they did that, because they wanted, uh, in prison, especially in USPs, you were never supposed to talk to a staff member alone. That was a no-no. You can get hurt for that. So what they were trying to do is take that away. They were trying to take the most powerful person in a gang and make them be alone for five minutes to show A, that it's okay to talk to staff, or B, that maybe your shot caller's cooperating. So you had to have a guy at the head that was really trustworthy. That's how actually, in the beginning, that I got elevated to the top spot, that's the truth. Anyway, so it's not, that was weird because I'd never talked to staff by myself prior to that. But, um, again, it after, after that experience, and that happened like for three years, uh, when I went to Butner FCI 1, I was no longer fearful or thinking that SIS, Special Investigator Supervisor, like we're just out to get everybody. They have a job to do, but the one at Butner 1, his name was Nevels, was cool as, was cool as cotton. They listened to all my phone calls. I did not know this for probably two years. Uh, and my phone calls were, were primarily related around business endeavors. You're not supposed to try to run a business from prison, but they figured, hey, he's not doing gang stuff, he's not uh, involved in drugs. Let him try to form a corporation and start a website. They didn't care. They, they, they literally didn't care. Now, me and Nevels didn't have any kind of a relationship where, uh, I didn't talk to him that much. It was mostly like out in line waiting for Chow when I was always with Carmine Persico. But he was cool, you know, I had no problem with him. Now, let's go to Butner 2 and I'll get back to the story Cadillac. 
At Butner 2, there was an SIS officer, and I'm going to do many videos about him by the name of Bronner. I always say that he was four foot ten or four foot eleven. No, he's more like five foot or five foot one. And uh, he was a super cop with the little guy complex. It's true. Bronner first crossed, we first crossed past at FMC Butner of the hospital. When I came in, he wanted me to be A, put in the hole or slammed down or just locked in my room. He was telling his staff that I was gonna be problems and I did not need to be in general population based on my institutional jacket, record. Had a lot of disciplinaries and uh, yeah. But he was overridden and, and uh, sure enough, I went to the hospital, a, a staff member approached me, I began buying cigarettes from him and I traded all the cigarettes for pills. So, you know, I did, I, I got in the hospital and hit the ground running and did exactly what he probably thought I was gonna do. And the guy was on me nonstop. And every time he would just take my property and go through it. So he was just, he was on me. When I got to Butner 2, this was right on the tail of the Bernie Madoff interview that, that made international attention. Media people were contacting me and Bronner was livid. He thought, he believed that inmates should have no right to publish anything. And uh, he made it clear to me. Also, they put me on email monitoring and I started getting, you know, it was, it took me over an hour in the morning just to, just to respond in a couple, a couple words to all the emails I was getting up to 600 a day, sometimes 60 to hundred in the morning for sure. So they don't like that because they have to monitor SIS has to monitor emails and it takes time away from them. So every day SIS would stand out in the middle of the compound before chow main line at lunch. And every day I was in Bronner's face and we were arguing about something email related or writing related or media related. And this was nonstop. People would see me talking to him all the time and started making accusations to other people. And the people that knew me and uh, Joey Testa would tell everybody, you know, that's BS. This is what he's doing. That was my biggest supporter at the time. Number one fan, Joey Testa. Uh, and, uh, but still, there were people quietly whispering, oh, this guy's a rat. He put this article out. Um, again, it's like my YouTube channel today. I put information out that's known within the prison system most of the time. A few times I have not. It's been that people didn't know a couple times. But the articles I wrote at Butner, FCI 2, uh, the illegal tobacco trade in federal prison, gambling in Butner 2, those were all done after bust, like that people knew about, like that was known within the prison system. That prison and the prison system. Okay, so let's go back to, let's get to uh, Cadillac. So I have already experienced people saying this about me, but this was different. This was we, me and T.Y. had conversations about uh, possible criminal activity. This is in 2013, and that's true. I find out the Cadillac pops off and says something, and I went in there with a knife and approached him aggressively at that point. He denied it. Um... At first, I think, and then he said, well, it was fish. I forgot, but whatever happened, I made my point and we went back to being friends and had a very good relationship for a long, long time. Now, the next thing that happened that I recall, and maybe he can say different if he ever goes on a, a platform and says something about that. So this is my memory, what I recall. This, what happened was this, inmates send money several ways you can send money off your prison account via a form um 199 i think it was called we used to call them form 24s back in the day that's a, you go to the computer you print it out uh it's a money withdrawal slip you sign a signature and you bring it to the counselor case manager whatever for a period of time they also had they also had a money gram you can send up to hundred dollars a day and let me tell you it was convenient for contraband buying stamps, drugs, uh, anything in the prison you're not supposed to have, food from the kitchen workers, very convenient. But it was overwhelming to staff, meaning 
if they're trying to investigate something, it's very hard when so many people are sending money. Man, I hope you guys can hear me in that buzz. It's driving me a little crazy. Again, I'm not, I don't, I don't know what time I can do another video. That's why I'm in the car doing this. Uh, well, Cadillac had a friend who was trying to sell stamps, a lot of stamps. Stamps in prison was currency. The guy more than likely was a drug dealer, but he'd sold all his drugs and now he had stamps for sale. So he wanted money. He wanted people to send his girl on the street money via MoneyGram. And I did. Now, here's what happened. The guy's girlfriend and him had a falling out, the girl that the money went to. She did not pick up the money. If the money is not picked up within 30 or 31 days from money from a MoneyGram location, it will go back to the prisoner's account, the account in which it came from. So, if I sent money to Cadillac's friend's girlfriend and she did not receive it, it should be on my books in 31 days. 32 days, I believe, or 31, after I sent the money, Cadillac comes to me and says, hey man, Hey, mom. He's full, full Jamaican. <laughs> he said the guy didn't get the money, the girl, the money was coming back, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, no problem. Well, I checked my account and the money did not come back. Now, this guy had multiple people send money. Let's say like 10. And let's say that was the 11th. All 10 people, the money came back on their books, except for me. Let's say I'm the 11th. So Cadillac saying, look, it had to come back. I left my account open and you can go all the way back to 2003 or four and see every transaction I ever made in prison on that account. It was pretty badass. So I can find out if I bought how much mackerel was in Leavenworth in 2003 or whatever, like that. That's an example. I left my account open. You can, it, the, it, it'll, it can stay open for an hour and let Cadillac go through my all my money transactions. And I said, hey, it, it didn't come back and, and sure enough he saw that it didn't come back but he thought I don't know at that point he thought I did something fishy but here's what happened a couple days later he comes back upset because he said the guy was making him pay for it and you know what I did Cadillac was my friend now yeah he got a little salty at me but I did believe him that, that the guy was making him pay. It wasn't some kind of game. I can see he was stressed out. And I said, I'll give you 50 bucks. We'll, we'll eat it. I didn't get the money back. I was hoping it would come back. Um, yeah, for sure I was. I, I never got that money back. But I gave him another $50. Okay, so there's, there's that. Um, the next thing. Okay. Cadillac ran a store. I frequented prison stores. I lived off stores a lot of times because I'm a fat bastard and an addict and I will eat everything in my locker. Um, so it was better for me to buy from a prison store, pay the 50% juice off each item. I, I'd rather do that than eat all my food in one day. Cadillac had a store. Not only did he have a good store, if he, he worked all day most of the time or all night, depending what crew he's on, he would either leave the combination open, his lock open, and it, it, there's a myth in prison, you always gotta lock your locker. So one of the things we said, meaning we white gang members or whatever, it's like, if you lock your locker, you're a pussy. You know, you're scared, which is actually kind of stupid, but then you start thinking, okay, well, I'll leave my, I didn't even, I never had a lock for almost 20 years. That's the truth. So, and, there was, and yes, I did have a lot of stuff in my locker. There was times I kept a lot of store. So it's, anyway, so I, I, I can go in and out of Cadillacs. I'll take whatever I want and write whatever I want down. He trusted me like that. I would never, I'm never gonna like just go grab a candy bar and not pay for it. That's stupid. Again, this guy was my friend. And I hope I got this right because there could have been something else that happened I'm missing that maybe he could have enlightened me on. Cadillac got moved to G Block, and I do think there was something else I can't remember. He moved to G Block, and I owed him like a hundred and something dollars. And that's a low bill for me in prison. <laughs> that, that's a very low amount. So, it, again, I've said many times before that 
people that know me in prison knew I pretty much had a gold card. I can get, on very few occasions, I could not get something that I wanted on credit. And of course, since me and Cadillac had a relationship, um, it was like $100 owed. I, I didn't see him or talk to him. And next thing I know, a friend of mine, Kid, his name was Kid, comes up to me and said, man, Cadillac's fucking smoking mad at you, man. He's, he's tripping. He's talking about money you owed. I was in a very bad mood that day for whatever reason. And as I've said a few days ago, if I'm in a bad mood and another event occurs, such as when Lee Cole contacted me and I went off on him, uh, then I have it, uh, I can act poorly. Well, when, when Kid told me this, I had just seen Cadillac, we walked in the yard in the morning. I didn't walk with each other, but he never approached me and asked me or mentioned the money, but he went to a friend, another white guy. Um, a lot of times if, if somebody doesn't pay, they'll try to find like a more serious white guy, shot car or whatever, to put pressure on him, you know, especially if it's a different race. But again, Cadillac was my friend. So I, I don't know why he said, Rob, when are you gonna take care of him? I went, found, went back down the hall when I learned this, saw him in the hall, went smooth off on him aggressively. And for the first time, he came back aggressive at me. Like, okay, let's fight. The first time I did it in his cell, he backed up and I'm not saying punked out. I'm not gonna, I'm saying he, I probably caught him by surprise and he was, you know, like, he didn't want any problems. I've seen Cadillac fight. I seen him tax somebody one time. I got a friend of mine named Jeff. He pieced him up so he can, Cadillac could fight. Now, so I'm not saying he's scared. I'm saying the first time I approached him aggressively, uh, he didn't want none. The second time he was ready to go. Uh, and I was as well, but there was a cop in the hallway too. This is over a hundred dollars. I then made sure I went to Noon Chow and went to the chow hall and approached him and we got in a yelling match and I, he thought I said I wasn't gonna pay him or something. I don't know what happened, but it was a miscommunication and like he was paid, uh, you know, that week or I forgot how it worked out or did I give him commissary? I forgot. I did suboxone on and off in prison, I've said this. Oh, I need to say this. There was something that went on between Cadillac and I, uh, and a friend of his on the street, there was another conversation, let's say, and I'm not gonna say it because it's uh, it's 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 like his family or, I, I'm, I can't do that, I can't, okay? So there was another serious discussion being had that we had a little falling out over. And I think once again, in his mind, he thought, okay, Rob's trying to do something, like like bust him or something, okay? So let's just say that. I, I don't know, he never said that, but there was something that happened, that's the other event. So then the one I told you about, where the $100. Well, I wanna say this was 16, 2000, I, I don't remember, 2016, but I, somebody said that Cadillac may have had pieces of Suboxone for sale. And he was deliberately told people not to tell me. So I'm like, huh, okay. And so he really had it in his head. Like, you know, like I, I was working with the cops in prison. I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, the truth is I had the same guys he told not to tell me, go get pieces from uh, because nobody else had none. So it was like, you know, okay, fine. I'm not gonna approach him, go ahead. I, I did approach him a couple times and he said, uh, maybe later, or like, he, you know, I got to talk to the guy, whatever. And it was like, okay, you want to do that? And I'll tell you this, like I said, I, I the, it did bother me because me and this dude were so cool and had really good conversation. When he moved out of the block, I missed him dearly. Uh, and that's because of the conversations that we had. We had great political discussions, uh, just a lot. We talked about women, we talked, he had, he had pen pal girlfriends. Uh, I had my girl talk to his pen pal girlfriends, like helped him out. I'm telling you, like, like this is a guy I would want to kick it with on the street. So, one day they do a roundup. At Butner, when they did bust, 
they did them like every other year or every year they'd round up all the drug dealers let everybody deal drugs as much as they wanted even approach the drug dealers and say hey, we know what you're doing and most of the time the guys just kept going well they did a roundup the first roundup involved some really close friends of mine and those two guys uh, I owed money to one of them. I owed $400. I was supposed to have money sent to the guy's mom, okay? So these are two Joshes, I'll say, okay? Well, I did not want to send money to his mom because he was under investigation. So I went to the other Josh who I knew the Josh in the hole owed money to, and I said, hey, I'll pay you. Now, a mistake that these that Josh and then later the other Josh made is these guys had a lot of money on the compound for whatever reason, and every day they were sending kites out of the hole, notes out of the hole. They would send it in food trays, they'd send it in laundry, and every single one of these notes was being intercepted by SIS. If it was in the food trays, like the dirty trays, they'd put them in the food tray, and the dishwashing guys, inmates would get them, and then pass the notes on. If it was in laundry bags, the laundry guys would get them, open the bags, they'd see the note, they'd pass them, because the note would say like, send to Robert C. Block. Robert Rossos or Big Rob, see whatever, whatever it was. Um, there was an officer by the name of Snyder. There's a many, many Snyders at FCI Terre Hutt. So Snyder was was a cop, but he because I was older, because I had life, because I didn't hustle in prison. They ever staff knew I got high when I got high. Like they knew everything. But Snyder, like he he would go shake down five cells a day. The guy didn't touch mine after he got to know me. So he came up to me and he's like, hey Rosso, I just wanna tell you, uh, your boys are sending kites out of the hole. There's a book that they got everybody's name on, your name's on it, so they're being stupid, so watch it. And, and he didn't mean watch like I'm gonna get in trouble, but like watch it that your friends are sending stuff out of the hole, okay? So, I mean, you know, notes about you. The guys were sending notes out of the hole. Okay, so the first Josh was trying to get me to send $400 to his mom. I wasn't doing it because they had his mom under investigation. Everybody knew. Then the second Josh goes to the hole. So the $400 is still owed, and they are sending like angry mail. Send the money, what are you doing? We've been your friend, and they have. These were my, these were my dudes but they're under investigation sending kites out and I don't want to get on the phone and send money because I don't know how serious the investigation was. You never know if they're going to go after and like make a case out of somebody. So that was the last thing I wanted to be linked to do. Well, ultimately they sent a, a note or a kite out to a guy by the name of Scotty who, yeah, he was like the shot caller of the yard for a short period of time. And he approached me and said it. And I'm going to tell you something. I do not like bills being passed. If I owe somebody, it's a real pet peeve of mine when one of their homeboys comes in and wants to collect the money. Or they send a kite out of the hole saying, hey Rob, you owe me $500, go ahead and give it to this guy. Oh, I hate that. And I'll do a video about that and the reasons why, because I've been jammed up over that. But so in the beginning, I approached Scott, he approached me. I went smooth off on the dude. Like you ain't, get, I'm not paying you shit. And I don't, like, I didn't know, I, I think I told him, I, I think you're hot. So the guy, Scotty, when he first got to prison, can't, no, he went, he did time and came back to tear out on a new case. Somebody stole stuff out of his locker and he told the cops to rewind the cameras and bust them. That's, that's in prison, that's snitching, okay? Even though that's something I'd want to do if I got stole, it's snitching, you're not supposed to do that. So when Scotty and he, Scotty, he was playing that shot caller role, you know, he was punching guys and getting out of line. When he did that to me, I bowed up on him and like, man, and I don't even know. And I think you're a rat. Like I said that to him. Again, I, I, I spin out when I, I, I kind of lose it. I, I, so, so Scotty told me to, that let's go down to the gym and talk it, meaning I, I thought he was wanting to go throw down and fight. In all honesty, I did not want to fight because I didn't want to get a shot because I had so many years clean conduct. But in this situation, and I was irate, phew, and they have spots in the gym you can get away with it. Oh, I went, I went. Uh, we did not fight, we talked for a long time, and I will tell you that I paid Scotty stamps for that debt. So that's what happened. Well, not long later, not long after that, Okay, so my my two Josh friends got locked up 
for uh, investigation for Suboxone, but they didn't lock up the big man, the guy who was the leader of the, of the Suboxone conspiracy. It was, you know, I think a month or two later, I forgot how long, maybe even longer than that, they got him and they locked up like seven more people. And one of those people was Cadillac. Now, here's what happens. All of a sudden, so Cadillac sent six kites out of the hole, six notes that I know of, to different people, six different people. All six of those people approached me and gave me the kites that Cadillac sent. In every one of those kites, Cadillac is saying that this person's a snitch, this person's a snitch. He's, he's naming people's names. Don't trust him, he got me busted, he's the guy. And on that list of names was me. And I didn't get it. Like, uh, first of all, I didn't buy, buy anything from him. But how did my name like get associated with that bust? The two Joshes were my friends. I knew what they were doing, true enough. But as far as I know, they weren't accusing me. I wasn't um, buying anything from my friend. I wasn't buying anything from Cat. So I, I didn't know. Well, a guy, I'm not gonna say his name because he's still in prison right now and he's got a leadership role. He came to me and, and explained, and he says, here's the deal, Rob. Uh, Cadillac is close with, and he named the staff member, a Unicor, a Unicor boss. I have to say this about Unicor. There are staff members, cops, correction officers that work in Unicor, that a lot of guys who work in Unicor become super friendly with and trust and they divulge information to one another. The staff will tell the inmate certain, certain things are going on and vice versa. There is one staff member in particular that Cadillac was close with, and I'm not gonna say his name either. Um, I, I think he retired, but I'm not gonna do it. Well, this guy was actually part of SIS, but People, he was so cool and had this thing going where he was saying that SIS always was accusing him that he tricked the inmates. And I believe, well, no, the guy who explained it said that this staff member is the one that told Cadillac like that I was part of, or I was the one who like got Cadillac. Locked. Like I, I, I worked with staff to get Cadillac. I think in my friends too locked up. Whatever the case was, I don't know exactly to this day. Uh, I was not mad at all. I was like, how the, how the F did I, how did I come up in this one? You know, they knew who the guy was that, that, that told. It was, it, it was obvious and it was known. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew it. Well, then Cadillac was in the hole. Let me tell you something about being in the hole. People in the hole are bored. A lot of drama on, on prison compounds, even in general population, has started because of bored people with overactive minds in the hole. You start thinking, conspiring, oh my God, ah. You know, you start thinking, oh, this is how it happened. Well, Cadillac, when he looked at my account years earlier, saw that every month, I think it was, I would put like X amount of dollars. So it was like $50 worth of true or hundred dollars worth of uh, email credits. True links is what they're called. And it was the same amount time and time and time and time again. He got it in his head that I was working for staff SIS and that they were paying me in email credits. And the reason he got that in his head is because everybody knew how important email was to me, no matter what I did, how big a store bills I ran or dope bills the time I ever did drug when I was doing drugs I always 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 made sure I had plenty of email because that was my relationship with Marta Marta was very important in my life so he told everybody yeah Robert's being paid in true links by SIS which was it can be proven in a whim and like like kind of laugh so it, Okay, so I was like, all right, you know, whatever. Um, 
I, I was hurt again. I was hurt, not angry. And and life went on. You know, it's it's like common in, in mediums, FCIs and stuff, for people to like, he's a rat, he's a rat. It's 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 terrible, it's thrown around real loosely. Not in maximum security prisons as much, but especially in, 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 in mediums and lows and camps. So some months go by and all of a sudden, Cadillac's girlfriend in England, I think, contacts Martin and says, oh, um, Delroy, Delroy told, wants you to buy, buy his book. It's, it's finally published. Now he wrote a book about his life. The first draft of the manuscript, I, I read and kind of gave him some advice and he took it. Then he had another guy, a friend of mine named Lou, type it and edit it. I was a part of that process. Um, and I didn't like the job Lou was doing. Uh, I would have done things really differently. He uh, he just wanted to type, get done, because Cadillac paid him, and move on. And I was like trying to tell him, no, this is repetitive. This is this. This is dull. This is it needs to be more of this. And Lou and I, Lou got mad at me and said, you know, like basically, don't tell Cadillac shit. I'm, I want to be paid and I want to be done with them. I'm tired of this. All right, so the last time I saw it, I, I, uh, I didn't like that edition. He, Cadillac then went and paid a professional editor later on. He publishes his book on Amazon. Oh, oh damn, I should have got the name of the book. I'll give you his name so you guys can look, because I, 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 I'm, I'm encouraging people to buy it. Because, uh, yeah, so in this book, I don't buy it off the, uh, so I, I'm, when his girlfriend contacted Marta and said, buy it, I'm like, no, don't buy it. This guy is saying that he told everybody this and this and this. So uh, I was going to buy it eventually just because, you know, because I knew him and, and I want to support people who write in prison because uh, I'm a writer or used to, was a long time. You know, it's been a minute since I've written. Um, all of a sudden, people in prison, a couple of my friends, close friends got the book. And here comes my friend, Face of Sereno. And he said, Rob, I got some bad news for you, bud. And I said, what's up? He said, Cadillac wrote in his book that you're a snitch. And I said, what? And it's like, yeah, he listed this person, this person, and this person, and, and said you. And I'm like, man. So he showed me what he put was white boy Rob. He didn't put Robert Roslow, but still it's, it's the point. And you know what? There's, there wasn't like everybody that knew, but it didn't matter. Uh, I remember talking to Marta about it and she was like, oh my God. And she was upset. That was your friend. Why did this happen? So the truth is, uh, like I said, I was told by a, a friend of Cadillac's that it came from an officer that I was hot. That's how they say it in prison. Uh, why that officer would do that I, to this day, I'm not sure. But anyway, I got out of prison. Um, when I got on Facebook, I found him. He's in Jamaica. He's doing well. Delroy Brown, Cadillac, Jamaica. On his front page, on the first page, he's got a link to his book on Amazon. And I would encourage everybody to go, if you guys got a little bit extra money, go support the dude. I I'm saying this right now. I reached out to him and I wrote him a long email. And I'm like, dude, I'm out. That's prison stuff. I don't even care. How are you doing? Straight up. Like I said, I like this guy a lot. So when I got out of prison, there's guys that checked in. There's a guy that had me locked up for... His name's uh, Chris. That had me locked up because I had a brick that came out of the wall that I hid contraband uh, behind. And when he checked in, because he owed a bunch of money, told the staff and, and had me hemmed up, uh, got locked up over it. I've talked to Chris. I've talked to I've talked to people that checked in or people say that were end up. I've talked to him. I'm a civilian, <laughs> uh, so. Um, the guys that were friends or had associations, associations with them in my life that, you know, had meant something in prison, I, if, if they did prison shit, I've overlooked it. I'm not committing crimes with them. I'm not going to commit more crimes. So I don't look at it that way. So I reached out to Cadillac and sure enough, he reached back and, and I, we're going to talk. We never did. About two weeks ago, I found out that he told another friend of ours, Ed, you check out Rob's YouTube channel. It's some shit. He's a rat star. I was like, for real? Like he's still doing that? Okay, whatever. So, oh, I reached out to him and said I was going to do a YouTube video about it. And then I would give him a chance to respond. I was going to help him with this book. That's what I told him. Uh, when my friend 
contacted me and said that. I was like, okay, I'm going to do the video. And uh, yeah, so here I am doing a video about it. Cadillac, a Delroy Brown, he's in Jamaica right now. Uh, he's got the link on. So if you guys would, if you have any money, go support him. <laughs> I'm, I'm still saying that. Uh, so yeah, so I, I, I'm, I have meant to reach out to many people. There are a lot of people. So I've got what, five interview requests right now. And, I, and I've told everybody I'd do them. And then shit keeps happening. I was going to do a video this morning or a, or a short and say, hey, tonight, I'm going to do a live at seven, da, 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 da. And for some reason, I didn't get around to it. And then sure enough, at 12 o'clock, I found out that I'm probably not going to be able to do that live. Every time I say I do something, almost every time, it's like I don't follow through because something happens. And Marta gets so mad at me and says, stop doing that. But I mean, it is what it is. Anyway, I wanted to put that story out there. I said I would do it. Uh, some people would say, don't give the enemy, don't give them fuel for fire, whatever. I don't care about all that. That's a story. That's a story that was personal and that's something that happened. Um, I'm probably never going to go to Jamaica. He's, uh, he can go to the UK or wherever under the crown. Um, but it, I think the worst thing is, like I said, I, I enjoyed his company a lot and he feels the way he does, but whatever. I'm, uh, again, um, I can stand behind whatever because uh, I have, you know, my truth on my side, I guess you would say. I say mine because people have different sets of truth and I think everybody's truth deserves to be listened to. That's, yeah, different set of whatever. All right, so there it is there. I hope you guys have a good Thursday evening. God, I would love to go live tonight, but I'm telling you right, as of right now, it appears that I won't be able to. Okay, take care.